Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our interview today with two of my favorite people in the RPG world. We have, Aww. of course, the amazing Celeste Konowicz, uh, current leader of the Project Black Flag for Cobalt Press, all around genius and, uh, yeah, wonderful human being. As for you, wonderful human beings, we have the amazing Jack Caesar, who I was privileged enough to work with on the Dark Crystal RPG, uh, also the system designer for that and for Equestria. And uh, honest to God, I cannot think of two better people to come and talk to you about <laughs> making your own RPGs, which is our topic today. So just so you know how amazing and how committed these people are. Jack, where are you calling in from today? Uh, so I'm calling in from Sydney, Australia. <laughs> um, yeah, where it's currently coming up to 5 a.m. in the morning. Oh, you're a so. hero. I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> And Celeste, awesome. I believe it's disgustingly early for you as well. Uh, it's not too bad here. This is a pretty leisurely 10 a.m. for me uh, in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. So I think I have the best of it uh, right now. <laughs> Well, I am absolutely honored to welcome both of you here. Let me do a proper introduction now. Um, Jack Caesar from Riverhorse Games is a game designer of the Tales of Equestria, the Dark Crystal adventure game, and the upcoming Tales of Primordia. Jack, one sentence pitch, Tales of Primordia, how much you're going to love it. Uh, change the world and become a dinosaur. God, I love it. Take my money. I know, right? Oh my god, I love everything about this project. I am so excited for it. You can check it out at riverhorsegames.eu uh, forward slash primordia, I think, can't you? Yeah, and I'm sure I'll be able to slip it into every other sentence. It's fine. <laughs> very smooth, very smooth. Yeah. And of course, we have the ever amazing Celeste. Celeste is a game designer based out of Seattle. She's the producer, GM, and editor of the actual play podcast, Venture Maidens. And when not plotting behind the screen, she works as senior game designer at Cobalt Press, one of my personal favorite game companies, um, and is currently the leading the code name black flag rpg project i want to say r every time i read that out Sorry. yeah yeah we do it a lot in chat so don't feel bad <laughs> constantly um our work slack is just full of r's so <laughs> sorry not sorry you can keep up with her at seat conowich over on twitter uh okay how do you make your own rpg <laughs> system mm -hmm. What a question. That is not my first question, I swear. Yeah. Um, Start at the beginning, right until you're done. Right, and finish. there you go, done. Short Do stream. A couple of hours, you know. This yeah. Obviously, this is, uh, this is something that takes people a really long time, even to do their first system. And, and you know, systems are like sequels. You can't have only one. You, you got to yeah, yeah, end up collecting them, I think. <laughs> How long did it take to make the, uh, the Dark Crystal and Equestria system that you guys use, Jack? Um, so, yeah, Tales of Equestria sort of came first. Um, that was probably, like, a few months of sort of hashing out and getting everything, like, laid out and how we wanted it. And then, sort of from then, you can do a lot of the other work. And whilst you can be playtesting an iterative design, sort of, you stretch that out for literally as long as uh, long as possible <laughs> that you... <laughs> That you could be allowed. Um, so, yeah, I think that was probably about a year, sort of up until, you know, we were locked in terms of everything has to, you know, go be properly laid out and off to a printer. So absolutely, probably about a year and a half. Then, about a um, year and a half. Would you Dark say that's Crystal, really stand oh, sorry, working with you was, was about the same, actually, I think. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, so uh, fairly similar, like a few months of, and then sort of working with the adventure and with with the world and with you um, to sort of create the uh, the rest of the system. Um, though that's a sort of much more condensed sort of system for that one. Yeah, absolutely. Would you say that's pretty standard, Celeste, that kind of time? Uh, I think it depends on the scope of what you're working on, because obviously things that are going to be like these gigantic, especially in the fantasy genre, we're seeing these, you know, 200, 300 page core rule books. I mean, just rules development alone could take a year on something like that. And then hopefully, you know, with playtesting in there and then getting the art and the layout. So it's nice. Yeah. When you have those tighter RPGs that are more self-contained, uh, you can do those, those faster timelines, but yeah, I mean, you're definitely looking at like, like Jack mentioned at least a few months of just like prime 
rules development and then you've got your play testing cycle and then on top of that of course all the other things that have to happen graphics and marketing and art creation and stuff so a year i think is is bare minimum <laughs> yeah you're what you're looking for 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 an rpg yeah, I really wanted to just sort of establish that baseline that this is not somebody like if you listen to this live stream and you go away with all the tools, don't expect it to happen overnight. All right. It's going to take you some time. That is normal. That is OK. Don't panic. You're just the same You're as everyone else. You're doing fine. Yeah, doing good. exactly. So where do you guys start when it comes to designing a system? You guys know, obviously, at World Anvil, we're a big fan of meta. We have the world building meta. Do you use something similar like a, a meta or a mission statement when you're kicking off designing a whole system? Yeah, so um, uh, generally what I what I try and do is the first of all. So we do quite a lot of um, themed systems. So, um, you know, we we're working with a licensor to create a role-playing game based on a pre-existing world or on our, our idea. Um, and so that that is actually quite a lot of help in a lot of ways because you have the um, you have the sort of the key questions are what are your players actually doing uh, in a game? Like where's where's the fun in the like where's your sort of USP? What's the world? And um, trying to sort of nail that down. So you've got your theme who your player actually is, who's your customer, uh, and where's the fun and the role playing in your in your world. So uh, for Dark Crystal, for example, um, we knew that a lot of people were going to be new to the role playing scene uh, and more likely to be fans of the Dark Crystal rather than fans of role playing games in general. Um, so keeping that in mind going forwards, whenever you're making a decision, you're going, oh, make it lighter, make it simpler, make it you know, talk as if this is the first time someone's picked up a dice that wasn't uh, a cube. <laughs> like, uh, and similarly, um, you know, they're going to be playing a Gelfling because uh, that's, you know, fairly early on. We knew that that was the adventure and that was the world that we wanted to to run. So whenever you're making rules, you can go, okay, is, does this feel Gelfling-y? <laughs> um, does this feel right in the, in the system that we've got? Um, so... As long as you've got those sort of core, what you, who you're pitching to, and what, what they're going to be pretending to be, and what's their sort of, what do you call it, the genre. Uh, like, so you know, the rules that you make for a horror game are going to be way different from the rules you make for a um, fantasy adventure and things like that. So, as long as you've got those questions in mind, the the mission statement and the meta, as you say, uh, that just helps you whenever you're actually thinking about a rule or a or a bit of the world to go. Oh yeah, I did. You know, I have to do this thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if that's <laughs> how you, how, how about, you go about it. Yeah. How about you, Celeste? Do you do you start with like a mission statement? Is that something that is familiar to you? Yeah, I think I think you know, riffing on a lot of what what Jack said, it's uh, it's so important to before you start any design, ask yourself some big questions. I always like to ask the big questions, like what are we doing here? Uh, why are we doing this is a big question. Like, why do I feel the need to make my own RPG system? Uh, especially in a world where there are so very many RPGs, um, answering the question of why why this one? What do, what do I need to tell with this one? What is the what is the angle here? That What's the niche I'm filling is so important and can help guide a lot of design. And then uh, I always ask myself, what do I want the player experience to be like? What should it feel like as a player uh, in this game? What what are the emotions we want to evoke? What are the kinds of stories we want people to be able to tell when they're playing? Uh, and of course, you know, GM storyteller is a player as well. But if you have an RPG with a storyteller, I always want to ask, what should it feel like as a GM uh, to be running this game? What is the level of complexity we're going for? What are the types of storytellers that we are trying to attract? Uh, and then when you have those core principles in mind, it can really, really help you start like that mechanical journey because if you want the players to have a very simple very easy to onboard like throw them right into it that's going to be a very different game than if you want the players to have like a really customizable like lots of choices micro decisions like really customizable character game so those are yeah kind of the big questions you always I recommend you always ask yourself before you even decide to really start making an RPG. Yeah, I think um, we said that like nailing down the genre of yeah. the of what you're making um, is is super important. Get it's huge. 
yeah, know know what type of game you're going to be running. Um, yeah, do you like? Is, do you want your your players to feel like they're you know heroes slaying monsters, or do you want them to feel like sad ghosts, like trying to solve their past? Right, like that's that's a very important decision. It's one of the reasons I'm I'm somewhat down on sort of uh, uni systems. This mm. idea of like one system to rule them all, yes. um, and and people sort of often come at it from something they love and they know, and that's always way simpler, isn't it? If you if you already know a system, like the amount of times I've seen people with Dungeons and Dragons sort of yeah. go, oh, I'm going to make it sci-fi, I'm going to make it you know a horror game, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that by changing and editing this and quite often twisting something that wasn't designed to be that thing into that thing um and it's it there's always a bit of distance and it's it's a harder job uh, to mm. sort of evoke what you want to evoke if you're starting from a completely wrong genre so yeah getting that nailed down as early as possible in the design process there is, um, I'm going to be quoting this book a lot. I do love it. I'm sorry. It's a very Cobalt stream today. Uh, this <laughs> yes. is the Cobalt Guide to Game Design. It's one of my favorite books about game design. A lot of it specifically about RPG game design. Um, and there is a fantastic essay early on, I think by Wolfgang Bauer, actually, um, who talks about how settings are doing their most and at their peak when they are furthering the fun of the setting. So the perfect example of that, of course, that everyone pulls up is the Call of Cthulhu. Cl Cl Sorry, I've been possessed. The Call of Cthulhu <laughs> setting, uh, where you know you have sanity points, and sanity becomes a, a a capital that you have to work with because that's so tied to the kind of fun that you're having. That's so tied to the the setting and and everything that you're working with. What are your thoughts on on how tied a system should be to a setting in that regard? Well, I think that, I mean, the closer everything you can do in your RPG to make it feel like more of whatever the story is you're trying to tell is the goal. So if you can have mechanics that interact directly with the kind of storytelling you have, like the sanity mechanic is a, is a great example of like how that immediately tells you what like the eldritch horror genre is all about right what is cosmic horror about having that mechanic emphasizes it without a player ever having to read anything about in that genre they already are steeped in the world so being able to pick options like that uh, is, is a huge part of the game so that's the goal like try to make the mechanics of the game feel the same as the genre and the more you can do that the better you get like one of my favorite examples like this you know cozy rpg genre that it's like starting to develop is a, is a cool thing um there's a company i think it's possible world games they they have these really cool little like notebook style series things and one was like a game called grandpa's farm and there's like a letter mechanic letter writing mechanic built into the game and sitting there having to like write a letter take the time with pen and paper to like reflect on what has happened during gameplay and stuff that just throws you so much into what that game is and how it feels to be there and like the slowness and the patience required to like have a farm right so the more you can achieve things like that is huge it's so very very important uh in a game yeah i think the the other thing with uh, with setting when tying it into into rules and stuff is it allows you to quite often skip a lot of steps of describing and explaining to people what your game's about. If you're making the Star Wars game, people know about lightsabers and they know about parrying shots and you know using force powers and things. And it's such a shortcut to you don't have to explain, oh, this is the thing and this is the thing and this is the thing. Um, and people expect sort of types of actions and types of of play from those from those worlds. So yeah, if you can use your setting to basically skip a lot of the legwork, um, there's this idea of um, sort of knowing what could be behind a door. Um, so players have a lot of fun when they're immersed in a world and know what could be behind the next door. They they know like generally what to expect. Uh, things are still obviously a surprise because they don't know if it's a gelatinous cube or a dragon. Um, but there's this idea of, oh, I know the world, but if I saw a you know, a gray alien, then that's that's too surprising. And that's something that doesn't really um, jive. So that's sort of a really useful sort of thing you get from theme and setting is it puts everyone on the same page and allows you to sort of simplify, simplify rules. 
So. Yeah. A question that comes up a lot. Classes, species, skill based. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the benefits of these and what kinds of games they are maybe not so useful for? Think, so uh, I think oh, oh go sorry. for it. I think I started the last one, so you should go. We'll trade. <laughs> um yeah, it's a big old depends uh from me. Um I think that uh classes and sort of well, especially classes definitely um have the massive benefit of giving uh players, especially new players, this package of this is generally how your character sort of feels. Um, so archetypes, so, in a way. Yeah, like, so Dungeon World has its playbooks and um, D&D obviously has its classes and things, and you go, okay, paladins are kind of like this. Uh, warlocks are like that. Uh, whereas if you're playing something more like Savage Worlds or, you know, a point-by system, then you are just saying, oh, here's the kind of things, go make a character, uh, which can be a lot more freeing in a lot of ways, but it's also it's hands off and it's easier to sort of get out, get out in the weeds and um, sort of not, not know what you're doing with races um, or like I races is, is sort of falling out of fashion as a, as a term for it. But I think, what is it? Pathfinder is ancestry. I think we use kids in I dark crystal. Yeah. yeah um, and sort of uh, that's an interesting one. Cause I think that I, I like, sort of going on a more nominal basis. It's like, oh, dwarves get this small bonus, but it's not something to build your whole character or thing around. Um, because I think one of the problems that you often fall into is, oh, half orcs make the best barbarians. So if you're making a character and you want them to be good and you're making a barbarian, then you should make a half orc. Or if you're making a half orc for character reasons, they should be a barbarian. And it, So the min maxing of... trap, essentially. Yeah, and it sort of punishes people for playing outside the box. Um, so I think that's that is a trap to fall into with um, with races, especially. Um, so, but it, it definitely evokes the world. And if you're if you if you're playing a world in which there are magical races um, due to your setting and stuff, you need them. You need them in there. And I think you do want a mechanical difference between them because the mechanics is how we explore the theme. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think uh, his, things like classes or species, uh, skills, uh, you know, features that you unlock as you go along. These are all additional layers of complexity that I think are necessary to games that you want to be playing for a long time. So the so if you're designing an RPG that's meant to be played in one, two, maybe three sessions, shorter arcs, you're going to need less of things like that because. You, you basically, you are not going to be with those characters as long as you are. So if you are playing these really long campaign games like Pathfinder or Black Flag, you know, like you're going to be staying with these characters for a long time. So you need something like a class that is going to unlock new features as you go along and keep you interested and excited in what's going on. So you need more options like these to keep player interest and to keep the hook. Like you're going to get to level 20. You're going to do it, right? Like you need those little uh, those bits. But I think too often people want to tack on a lot of this stuff onto shorter games, which then that's when it becomes problematic. I think like some of the, the games that I think do do character like a, a really nice balance are like powered by the apocalypse games. I find like in general are a nice way where there's really not too much going on with your character. You do have these playbooks, uh, but you have just enough like options where you can get these moves to really last you like a nice seven to 10, I feel like session arc is about the natural like length of a player played by the apocalypse like game. Um, so that that's a nice like moderate ground I feel like to shoot for. Whereas if you're making a one page RPG, I mean, really you just need probably like three stats and each player focuses on one and there you go. Uh, so yeah, like, like Jack said, it really depends on how big you want your game to be, how long you intend for the, the game life and the gameplay experience to last. Amazing. Um, I think we've been talking a lot about theming and, and sort of the, the play experience. So I'm going to go on to a, a much much contested thing, the conflict resolution mechanic. So this is basically how do you make decisions about success in a game? Uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, you roll a dice, 
and you see what happens and you can modify that dice with your abilities and your skills and that gives you a higher number and if it's high enough then you succeed uh other systems use uh uh dice pools they use jenga towers they use cards what are the options here and what are the pros and cons of them essentially like how, how can you use them intelligently to achieve what you want to achieve with a game uh, yeah, I think on this one, I mean, this is like the heart of it, right? Uh, so number one, once you decide what what the game should be, uh, the number two thing you have to do is decide what the mechanic is. What is the core mechanic of your game? Like you mentioned, is it the dice pulls, is it cards, is it D20 based? Uh, and again, I think this, this leans in a lot to how complex you want the game to be. Because obviously, if you have a game that's, you know, a, a pool of 3D6 dice and over or under, right? Like, that's a lot simpler. Um, and more contained than if you have multiple dice and you're rolling all kinds of different stuff. And even if you're using like a D 100s, right. Or percentile system, that's just bigger numbers to deal with. So it becomes like, it scales up in your brain. Uh, so complexity is going to be really tied to that. Uh, and then I think always, if you can do something innovative with your mechanics, that's, that's, a very interesting thing to do. I'm always attracted to those games that's like, hi, all you need is a 52 deck of playing cards to do this mechanic. And I'm like, how? What? Tell me more. Like this kind of stuff is, is really cool and exciting. And we're seeing it more and more. People push the boundaries of these mechanics. Uh, so yeah, like you were mentioning Jenga Towers or uh, all, all just kinds of interesting things, you know, using tarot cards to like guide what happens in a game or encounter cards. Like that's the whole thing or unlocking puzzle pieces, right? That actually like translate to things you're coming up with. So obviously there's a lot of options out there. And if you can't go big and creative, because sometimes you can't, we are still bound by the laws of you know space and time and how games work. Uh, pick something that really just doesn't feel weighty or interferes, I feel like, with the kinds of stories you're trying to tell. Whatever mechanic you use should feel like a nice fit. Uh, so, I mean, primarily I designed for T D20 based systems. Uh, and the reason is it's fun because it's so swingy, right? It's so swingy, yeah. the range of it. So there's a lot of moments that are like absolute failing and absolute success and somewhere in the middle and then lots of bonuses that can enhance or subtract those. So like the games I designed do tend to be quite crunchy in that because people are like, oh, that's the fun, right? Gaming, like making sure you get that bonus so you can like nail that chance of success every time. Uh, but the swinginess factor doesn't work for a lot of other games. So uh, really looking at what you're trying to do, uh, getting something that fits with the types of stories you're going to tell and is going to enhance, again, that player experience, circling back to it. What should it feel like when you roll or interact with a mechanic right at your table? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think the... Uh, oh, what was I going to say completely? Oh, yeah, the um, you were saying about simplicity. Like, I think... The simpler your mechanic, the less it needs to do in your game. Um, so if you have something really simple, then it like so Dungeons and Dragons has a very simple conflict resolution mechanic. You roll a d20, you add number, succeed or fail, like uh, maybe crit or, or critical fail. But um, that sort of simplicity does allow you to you know have combats where you're rolling that you know twice around everyone sort of rolling this conflict resolution mechanic over and over again uh, very quickly and sort of able to do that. Something more sort of involved like uh, Genesis where you're making a dice pool and then there's four different symbols and you're sort of counting up and there's benefits. So maybe you succeed, but there's a, a threat applied and this, that, and the other. I think with systems like that, um, you need to sort of have your mechanic do more. So rather than that conflict resolution being a, a round swinging the sword in D&D, you have it be the whole combat. You know, you, you roll the dice and that's sort of a much bigger impact in your game because at the end of the day, you don't want, people aren't there to sit around sort of doing the maths for every life. If you have a complex resolution mechanic and it's just sort of swinging a sword, then you have to do that 10 times and... Um, you're sort of adding a lot of weight to your game. Um, the other thing I was going to uh, <laughs> to mention uh, um, is like when you are doing your conflict resolution, it's sort of um, often sort of considered a bit of a boring bit. But 
doing the maths and working out what your your probabilities and like of success once you've actually decided on your on your system is a really useful like tool to use i just thought i'd um share up sort of oh, what i'll yes. often do <laughs> love love a good math mechanic spreadsheet oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um this is a few of the games i've worked on and stuff of um basically different dice ideas and systems and what the chances of success at certain skill levels and things like that um which like isn't it's not a bible and it definitely never just says oh that's you know that's how the game works or that's good uh, you must always have a 50 percent chance of success at this that or the other um but it does give you somewhere to start um, and it can highlight sort of how effective your bonuses are, you know, in a, um, in Powered by the Apocalypse, where you're rolling 2d6, plus one and plus two are big bonuses um, because of your bell curve. Whereas in D&D, &D, you know, you don't care about a plus one or a plus two. You're just, um, yeah, it, it's a much smaller benefit. It's five, 10%. Um, so I think, once you've got your conflict resolution down, and, and maybe you do have something that's wacky like tarot cards or, or Jenga tower, um, doing a bit of the maths just so that you know where you are and what sort of the chances of success are in your game. Um, because you get games like Call of Cthulhu where success is pretty difficult as um, as standard. <laughs> like uh, You'll have skills of you know 50%, which means you're failing half the time. Um, it is nice in a percentile system that the the, um, the maths get a lot easier because <laughs> you you have literally percentages to to mess about with. Um, but yeah, doing that that process um, for a lot of people who are into RPGs, it's it is a difficult part of it. Um, the simply the maths. Um, I remember a story of a um, friend of a friend designing a system and it had hit locations. So whenever you sort of hit mm. someone, uh, you roll 2d6 and that was, you know, there was a chart that told you where they hit. They were like, this game's so funny. Like, you're always hitting people in the groin. Uh, like, and I don't know why. <laughs> it's the math. groin was on set on the <laughs> Oh no, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. But it was a 2d6. Um, so Perfect like, slapstick system. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it wasn't intentional, but it is one of these things oh. that, like, once you actually start sort of um, looking into it, you, you <laughs> get a lot of this these ideas out. The other thing I'd say with conflict resolution um, is so something I do quite early in the sort of so you've got the like the meta and the the design brief of the whole sort of game, and then when I'm actually going into sort of the rules bit, I start making a list. I'll do this with board games as well of um what the the things in the game are drawing cards adding Resources. bonuses to dice the yeah the whatever sort of mechanics there are to change or add bonuses and malices to to systems and say what those equate to in the rule in the rules so um in the dark crystal um the skills are plus one plus two like uh, that's a that's a static bonus it's your skills um, and then situational bonuses are basically like advantage in D&D &D is, is a re-roll of the dice or a re-roll and take the lowest. Um, so this sort of allows you to stay consistent throughout the, throughout the game. Um, if you're, you know, if you're drawing cards because you're fast, um, then you, you've tied being fast to drawing cards and people will sort of link those two things in their minds. If suddenly someone's drawing cards because they can see the future, then you're kind of, yeah, you're creating a dissonance there that doesn't need to be there. Um, so literally making a list of of what sort of your themes are, like what, like being strong equals X, being the equals X, um, and trying to keep that consistent uh, throughout your conflict resolution. I quite like systems that, so sort of tied to that, um, kind of a bit like Genesis or Forbidden Lands is really good for it. Um, where, so your skills are your red dice, your 
a tribute is another type of dice and your your equipment is a third type of dice and you roll it all in the big dice pool and six is a success is one's a fails basically um and what that means is that when you succeed you go oh my sword is why i succeeded my skill is why i succeeded and that that's really helpful and if you can sort of help people tell the stories with your conflict resolution mechanic um they go oh because of this bonus i got because i hid behind a couch like he didn't hit me well that that suddenly tells the story of he hit the couch he would have hit me but he hit the couch and like yeah if you can fit those in without adding weight that's a really big bonus um yeah i feel like we could do a conflict resolution mechanic stream by itself <laughs> probably like, i feel yeah. like something that 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 is something that we could easily talk about um let's move on for now because <laughs> As I said, first more stream to talk about fair big topic. Um, and we're really, we're really sort of, I want to touch our bases here. Um, we've talked about conflict resolution mechanics. So I feel like next we should talk about balance. What does it mean? What, what do we mean by balance in an RPG? And how Nothing important is balance in a TTRPG? Uh, oh boy. Oh boy, I, I'm sure, Jack, you have this experience too, but everybody in the world loves to say things are unbalanced or too balanced. And I don't think anybody really, there is very little in terms of objective meaning to balance. Uh, I think probably the best definition is like, uh, does it feel, does gameplay feel like what you intend it to? Uh, if the answer is yes, then your game is balanced. Uh, so really it's like, are you making a game like Call of Cthulhu where the point is that you are failing and you are falling apart? And that's part of gameplay, right? So if most of the time characters are failing and getting these penalties and having to deal with the penalties, then that is balanced because that that is what the game is designed to do. Whereas like in a game like D&D or y y basically you want the heroes to feel like badasses constantly. So they get very powerful and stomp monster face. That's not a break in the system. That is totally intentional to feel like an epic hero, uh, like God level hero, you know, the higher you get. Uh, so that is the balance that is built into the game, right? So whatever it is that you're trying to do mechanically, as long as the players are having that experience, I think that's the kind of balance you're aiming for. And that's what like we mean as designers when we when we talk about balance. Is it fun? Is it doing what you want it to do? Is it like moving along at a pace that is appropriate for the game? That's balance. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd say the the idea that the, the feel of balance is so much more important than balance itself. Um, and if if everyone's doing different things or, or is capable of different things, then sort of they are balanced in a way that is very it's at least very hard or, or opaque to to compare. So you know if the wizard can fly, but the barbarian is the only one who can really like smash face and do damage, then they're occupying different roles in the party. And they're like, it's not, oh, this guy can fly, but this guy can fly better. Um, and that's very easy to compare and say, oh, this guy's stronger than that guy because he can do everything that guy can and more. Um, so yeah, keeping sort of roles quite, maybe not strict, uh, can be a good way of, of at least keeping the feel of balance. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, there's an old like, what is it? Um, nobody hates an overpowered bard. Um, <laughs> so if a if a mechanic is sort of try and make mechanics based on teamwork and helping others more powerful. Um, and if they're overpowered, that's fine. Like if I'm helping someone else out and they like and we stomp face because i helped them out that's a brilliant feeling like you you feel clever you feel like you've done a done a tactic um and it's it's a really like yeah no one complains like if the bard is super powerful no one's complaining because it's helping everyone out uh whereas if the the fight is super powerful then they're kind of hogging glory and they feel like everyone else feels useless rather than boosted um and I, I sort of made the joke of there is no balance uh, at the start, but 
I think there is one person who can balance the game and it's, it's not us. Um, like the GM is is there in the trenches and they are like they are able to like change the encounter or add you know more stuff or try and like realize that someone's skills like the whoever wrote this book was a moron and <laughs> like decided that you know this guy only needed one very specific skill that happens in one specific time and thought that was balanced out by a, a super useful and super versatile talent that someone else has well make that very niche skill turn up in your game and like it's it's important as game designers to make sure gms understand that like we're not gods like the the rules are there to enhance and make the game fun uh, but you're there on the front lines and you know what your players like like you are there to have fun. And if you want to change stuff, change stuff. I'd say warn your players first, but like do make it yours. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, tabletop role playing is, is such a participation hobby. Like we're, we're here to create everyone is, um, and being a part of that is what makes it fun. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, uh, two things about that the one is a really important point you are always designing for the gm you are not really mm. designing for the player because everything that you do goes through the gm pretty much like that, that's not true of player splat books and that kind of thing but in general right like it all comes through the lens of somebody else who is deciding how the fun hits the table uh the other thing i would say is nobody plays rpgs to be sad nobody <laughs> plays rpgs because they hate their players so um that I think that's something to always bear in mind is that everybody's there because they want to have fun and anything that's stopping the fun is something that's not balanced at the end of the day. Like if it's if it's an inhibitor of fun, see if you can remove it. Yeah, I think I think something something uh, you said, Jack, like really resonated. It's it really is about like, especially if you have multiple character options built in, which you probably should uh, in, in especially longer form RPGs, uh, as long as every player can play wildly different options and they feel like they are doing the same amount of things. Uh, that mm -hmm. is a really, really great way uh to make sure things are balanced that's why i think most of the time when play testing happens i definitely focus on character options and how they feel next to each other just because that that is players do have less of that power to like control their game experience right so they are more tied to those mechanics so if those mechanics can all feel really nice next to each other nobody wants to be the sad like monk that can't hit anything right in the in a party like yeah every, everyone needs wrong options right <laughs> Everyone yeah. needs their time to shine and yeah. balance. It like, shouldn't be balanced most of the time. So someone's choice should have made their life easier. Uh, you know, every encounter, you know, should have, oh, the wizard has a spell for this, or the yes. barbarian's the only one who can smash down this door, or yeah, like yeah, it shouldn't yeah. shouldn't be everyone is equally good at everything all the time, obviously. Yeah. But um, that yeah. actually brings me to my next question, which yeah. is uh rewarding players and leveling up so this is not part of every single rpg and many interesting rpgs i've played have handled this differently but what are the best ways to encourage character progression and growth which is really what we're talking about here like yes you can give somebody a sword and a bigger number but what we're really aiming for is a realization of a character seed into a character tree uh, if that's not too flowery. So what are the best ways to encourage that? And what mechanical ways can we encourage that? So I think, so I've, I've been messing around with quite a lot of ideas of ways of shaking this up. Um, so something I I kind of, dislike's a strong word, but so Dungeons and Dragons is a game that is, is played in two places. It's played on the table and it's played at home when you're making your character or designing your character or thinking about your character and, and sort of working forwards. And because Dungeons & Dragons has this very sort of expected character tree, people do design ahead. They go, oh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to take fighter until fifth level and then I'm going to dip into monk for a couple of levels and do this. Probably wouldn't do that. But <laughs> sort of you have this, this plan. Um, and so that's something I quite like working in systems or when I'm GMing, trying to work out ways of disrupting, usually through reward. Um, so basically giving players um, options and, and sort of traits or um, 
what you call it, devil's bargains, like of, oh, you know, you've you've met this stranger who's willing to teach you this this arcane trick, and suddenly they have this thing they never knew about that they might go, oh, actually, if I build around that, then I've changed my direction. Um, and a player sort of become a favored person of a god, so they sort of became much more sort of focused on um, <laughs> so suddenly warlock in the uh, in the Twitch. Yeah, exactly. Like that. I think warlock is a really good one. If you meet someone who's willing to give you a, an evil pact, then that's a brilliant like story. And I think trying to disrupt that and make leveling up and progression tied to the story rather than something you've you've decided at the beginning that you're going to do this. So um, something we did in um, Dark Crystal uh, was, um, again, this was something to do with trying to keep the rules as light as possible, is all of those, all those rules of how to make your character Basically, you you choose a, a clan of Gelfling and you get, I think, two traits. Uh, so you get a clan trait and you choose one from a list of three. Um, so you know you've got four traits in the book basically for each for each clan of Gelfling. But during the adventure, we have tons and tons and tons of people you meet who are willing to teach you new new feats, new skills, uh, new abilities. Um, you might find a um, a sort of a mystical item that bestows a blessing upon you, which changes the way your character plays. And you can spend your XP on these on these new opportunities. You, you're rarely forced to to take anything. It's just like, hey, would you like this new special ability? Spend some XP and you get it now uh, as a choice rather than a sort of tome of stuff that the player can take away. And it sort of helps bring that sort of discovery and improvisation to the to the game, not just... Yeah, I have a. I, I think that yeah, trying to get more of the game at the table rather than sort of at home, um, yeah. is is something I think is is worth thinking about. I wanna I wanna add something there if that's okay because uh, go for it. I I designed a lot of those things. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the things I wanted to do was bring the Gelflings in contact with the world and the mystery. So that was something that I spent a lot of time doing is how can I bring the Gelflings to the mystery, uh, to the core conflict of the world, to the core the core mysticism that they don't meet every day, but is something that everybody loves about this world, right? And that was a great way of keying into, okay, everyone loves this thing about the Dark Crystal. Everyone loves the talking to animals. Everyone loves the weird, weird mystical magic that is, is not explained at all. There's no meta midichlorians in the dark crystal it, there's, <laughs> there's there's nothing scientific about the magic it is wild and weird and that was one of the things that uh made a really good leveling up system in my opinion because it really keyed into something core in the setting that was not accessible in other ways so i would say that it worked i think it was nice Sorry, I will let you speak, Celeste. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's a great point. I, uh, I, yeah, no. This is all like super great stuff. There's, there's so many ways you can do this in your game, whether you're tying it to narrative or or mechanics. But um, one of the things I think that is the most successful you can do to encourage people to push their characters to change, to grow, is to give some kind of reward for failure. Uh, whether that is like mechanical, like in Powered by the Apocalypse, when you fail, you get, you know, to mark off things on your tracker, boom, and that's how you like get new things. Uh, or if you are um, doing something like narratively, uh, you reward players for making suboptimal decisions or risky choices by maybe giving them access to new magic items. Or, yeah, like you said, giving them that warlock like pact. Uh, this is something I, I'm constantly talking about, like in fantasy economy games, like the most important thing you can do as a GM is give players like consumable items, give them magic so they can know that they can use them because you're going to give them more. Right. Mm -hmm. So establishing that kind of trust, like if you you give, then I will give back, like having some kind of mechanic here. So if you are failing, like it sucks to feel like, oh, man, I just I, I failed that role and nothing happens. And combat moves on mm. like that doesn't feel good to anyone so if you can find a way to be like hey even failing can be an interesting part 
of this story. Failing means X happens, uh, or, you know, success means Y happens, but like failing also is X. Like that's an interesting thing. So finding ways to fail forward, uh, if you can build those mechanics into a game, is a fantastic way to encourage uh, players to push the boundaries in narratives. Uh, to take risks, uh, to just really want to move things forward in maybe directions that they didn't expect. So that is a really great way if you can build in a fail forward mechanic. Uh, that's a that's a fantastic way to do them. Again, I have a horrible feeling that we could do an entire stream on rewarding <laughs> players, leveling up the different ways that you could... Uh, I'm going to have to get you guys back, clearly, because you're both <laughs> fascinating at talking... <laughs> talking about RPGs in such a great way. I am I'm absolutely loving it. Um, I should get on with the questions because I did promise that we would be doing an overview kind of stream today. But guys in the chat, if you want these guys back, shout it loud, shout it long, and maybe, maybe they will come talk to us again. <laughs> so in the meantime, how often should you play test and at what points? As soon as you have something fun. All the time, as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> ABP, always be play testing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, don't don't try and make things perfect. Try and make things playable and then play them. Because, like, yeah, you can waste so much time trying to perfect something. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets to the table, you realize something else was more fun or some part of it was great, but it's a kernel and you can build off of that. Like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get something playable and play it as uh, much as, as possible for as yeah, long as possible. Yeah, especially, especially with strangers as well. Yeah, with strangers too. Yeah, especially if you have weighty systems that are going to have like a lot of classes or a lot of playbooks, a lot of different options. Uh, the sooner you can start playtesting just the basic even mechanics and then ramp up like test one version of a character option and see how that plays and then test three more, right? Don't design them all. Hopefully you can design in phases. Hopefully you're given that timeline so you can get that feedback and you can use it uh, to inform your decisions as you're going along. Because if you design the whole 200 page book thing all at once and dump it in front of someone for playtesting, that's ridiculous. And then also you're not going to get great feedback because you have to spend so much time with a system that large to give accurate feedback, uh, to master how to play it, uh, let alone like, yeah. So do it in phases. Mm -hmm as soon as possible, lock in your core mechanic, run a play test, right? Uh, once that's good, make two options of the 10 you plan and play test those, right? Do it in phases and have it be an active part of your design, if at all possible. And also don't forget, yeah, do play testing with strangers. Don't just play test yeah. with your friends. Uh, a play and, test, and if you can, yeah. inexperienced yeah. people as well. Like, inexperienced yeah. people. People who've never played an RPG are the most valuable resources ever for playtesting yeah. um, because they're going to really give you the I don't know what's going on feedback that <laughs> sometimes you desperately need. And as I guess know, the, I'm so good. Uh, just the, uh, like, when taking a playtest as well, like, the, the playtesters can't be wrong. Um, they're like if they're playing the game wrong, you've written something weird or you've not explained something you should have. Um, and that's that's your problem, not theirs. It's like their problem. Uh, so, yeah. um, so pay attention to what they like. Pay attention to what they get confused by. This is this yes. is what we're saying, yeah? Uh, but pay attention also, to what they hate and what they love. That's the most yeah. valuable feedback. Uh, most of the time when people are like, yeah, okay, like that's not really helpful feedback. But when people is like, I absolutely want this to be blown in the universe i hate this i hate that i had to do this blah, blah, blah. that is such interesting feedback because you're like why and why did that get such a big emotional response and can i capitalize that in a positive way right um uh, yeah i have a i have a list of questions basically a, a feedback sheet um that it's mostly used for for board games but for uh, tabletop role playing games as well um and what I try and push there is, how did you feel about this? How did you, uh, you know, what did you like most? What did you blah, blah, blah. I, what is, is lovely to get from playtesters, but not all that useful, is that they will come to you and go, oh, it should work like this, or it should change like this, because that that's how your brain works. It tries to solve problems, and, and that's sort of what you want is, I didn't like this, or I did like this, like... Because then you go, oh, what's the problem? And then you can solve it from a sort of mechanical, like you 
you're going to know the system sort of more than them and whatever they've suggested might might be a good idea it might break other stuff but what you want is like, if they say oh you should draw more cards at this stage what they're saying is i didn't feel like i had enough cards I had enough to do like, right yeah or, oh, yeah or even that um so yeah try and try and work out the core problem uh don't just do what they say <laughs> what i love about this is this is exactly the feedback for beta readers this is this is everything that we've just said about playtesting. It's also true for beta reading. You can't have the same person beta read a book twice. It doesn't work. You can't have um, uh, people in the wrong group give you feedback that is useful. So if you give somebody a romance book and they don't like romance books and they go, yeah, there was loads of romance in this. Well, that's not useful <laughs> feedback, right? Yep. So find find the people that you listed in your mission statement as these people will love this thing and then go and find them and get them to play test because those are the ones that are going to give you the feedback of the people you are trying to reach in the first place. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a mistake. A lot of people make is like, not everyone, not every book is for every reader, man. Not every, not everyone loves Pathfinder too. Some people just want to pay honey heist. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. I want to play honey heist. I want to play um, Honey Heist too. That's the thing that's my long list of games. Heist. <laughs> that's the secret of Honey Heist. Everyone wants to play Honey Heist. Everyone's like, dang, that sounds so fun. Yeah. See, it's a good, it's a good hook. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> we have so many amazing questions. I will not possibly get to them all. But uh, Kayatan asks, what are some cool conflict resolution mechanics that you think are too underutilized by systems? Ooh. Um, I really like, uh, like edge of the empire is really good about doing this, mm -hmm. like getting those, uh, you know, when you roll, sometimes you can get force or destiny or whatever, like, and the, those give the GM like a reason to like up the stakes or players a way to like up or lower the stakes. So I think I love those kind of storytelling mechanics that are tied to it. It's like, how can I do this? And it's totally a creative carte blanche in a lot of ways. Like, what does it mean that I have to up the stakes? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I think that's just encourages such great like creativity uh so things that can actually like raise the stakes or lower it and interfere with or like enhance uh the the storytelling and the tension i think are great underutilized mechanics yeah anything that um helps tell the story i think is is so huge i think if you're not if your dice system isn't helping tell the story it should be as simple as possible well, obviously, it's going to be helping tell the story because it tells you whether you succeeded or failed. Um, but so, yeah, the the Genesis system, the the Edge of the Empire, sort of does that by your bonus dice are the thing that tell you you succeeded, so you know why you succeeded. Um, uh, similar to, I really do like the um, uh, Forbidden Lands system. Um, they do a they really nice uh, conflict resolution mechanic because um, it is sort of partitioned in that way but then very simple um which yeah and then you've got this option to push something which makes it dangerous but gives you a higher chance of succeeding okay, and when pushing, you're pushing mechanics yeah, are always super yeah fun. push it yeah yeah um uh i do like a a system like i think I haven't seen exploding dice in a long time. Like Savage oh, Worlds. We, we just um, did some exploding dice for our Tome of Heroes, our gunpowder rules, and we got to play oh, around with those, and that was yeah. so fun. Uh, so we took exploding very literally, but exploding dice. Nice <laughs> <so fun. laughs> oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Anytime um, more dice, like if you can roll a fistful of dice, that's sad. I don't care who, what game you're playing. If you can yeah. give a player a fistful of dice to roll, boy, is that satisfying. It feels powerful, it which feels plays into that awesome. like power fantasy, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any anyone who's played a game with exploding dice for any amount of time has a story of the time they threw a brick at Cthulhu and rolled ten sixes in a right. row, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, like or something. Like, um, and I think for a certain type of game that that creates these moments and yeah i think yeah doing that i also love like mage of the ascension is really good about doing this <gasps> like things that let you creatively mm. build like spells or interact with magic so th they don't tell you how you can use your points in this kind of magic and this kind of magic but they invite you to like make logical marriages between those like how freaking cool like those that kind of narrative like it feels so much like a, what a wizard or a mage would be doing uh that kind of stuff is just so juicy okay i want to answer this one as well um i will go very quick through the breach 
I love the system. I love the world. I love the system. It uses cards, which I like. But Through the Breach is all about fate and tarot. There's an amazing character uh, level up mechanic whereby at the beginning you draw cards that determine little snippets of poetry, like um, uh, prophecies almost. Oh, and cool. if you can persuade the GM that something in your <laughs> session fulfills a prophecy, then you level up and you get extra cool stuff. So it's so all cool. about prophecy and fate and then the cards, right? Because it's like a tarot deck, okay. but you can also cheat fate. So mm -hmm. if you if you draw a card that you don't like, you can put down one of a very limited number of cards that you have in your hand to cheat fate and make different things happen. Thematically, it is so beautifully put together. It's one of my favorite di um, like conflict resolution mechanic systems because of that. Yeah, I would play it all day. Again? Love I'm reading it. I'm so reading it. Through down. the breach. Through the breach. Um, <laughs> it is the role playing system of the miniature game Malifaux. All um, uh, right. Uh, I don't play miniature games personally. I, uh, that's not the kind of fun I like to have. Uh, I would play that game every single day of the week. It is just like through the breach. I'm just, I'm there. If you tell me there's a game, I'm at the table. Just, cool. Yeah, love it. All right, one mm -hmm. more audience question. I think we just about have time. Oh, yes, this is a nice one from Raja. What would you say is a good way to determine the right amount of crunch for a particular genre? Or I would open that up to a particular game. <laughs> um, I think that crunch is more based on your player than the genre. Um, so. Uh, there's there's stuff that obviously lends itself to crunch. If if your game has combat in it, that is that is so much easier to slip sort of strategy mechanics and and things in there. Um, uh, I, I struggled for a while um, creating a um, uh, a hacking a cyberpunk role playing game where the idea was that basically hacking was given uh, more or equal sort of. Uh, complication and crunch as as your sort of combat and the struggle that you end up there is it's ethereal and you don't intuitively understand hacking in the same way that you do um, uh, physical violence. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's like obviously combat stuff lends itself to crunch, but I think it's your your player the, rather than the the system. Like there's stuff like mutants and masterminds, which is superhero stuff, and boy is that crunch. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and then you've got you know D and D and stuff, but then on the that same genre is Dungeon World, and that's way simpler. Um, so it does the same same job, um, but you know some players prefer one, some players prefer prefer the other. Yeah, I think I think if you look, uh, really look to what is the what are the challenges in your game? Like, what does conflict look like in your game? What are those encounter types? Uh, and then what do you need to support those? Because th those are really where your mechanics are going to come into play. And if you want a game that doesn't have a lot of like conflict resolution, that's not really what you you want a game that's more about telling stories, then you should definitely look at, at those mechanics and be like, okay, so I don't need a lot of interesting mechanic for all the other things because like, I, I want less mechanics because it's more about people sitting around mm -hmm. a table telling stories, right? Then that's going to be very mechanically light. Whereas if you're making a game like D&D, &D, Black Flag, etc., that are about stomping monster face, like being a hero and killing monsters, then you have to have a robust combat system that's going to be part of what the game is and you you have to give that its proper weight so looking at what you want to do and how much of the player's time is going to be spent doing various things the time the, that they're putting into a certain thing is going to need more mechanical support than something else so that's where you should focus your crunch cannon uh <laughs> wherever you need like where are the players going to be spending most of their time what do you want them to be doing at the table and then that is going to be the way you start determining where the crunch goes in your game sorry crunch cannon just sounds like crunch cannon a, a cereal <laughs> yeah. <laughs> captain crunch cannon uh i yes. am here for crunch cannon and stomping face i yes. i think we've established the good terminology here i'm very happy with it um very so very official game design yes terms. yes Yes, this is this is the official nomenclature of game design. You're welcome. You're welcome, my beans. Um, okay, final takeaways, final advice. If somebody is sitting here in the live stream, like my beautiful beans are, and they are thinking, okay, I've heard it all. I'm ready. I want to go off and make my own RPG system. What final advice would you give to people who want to make their own t tabletop RPG systems? 
get it get a team um get more people the more eyes you can get on something uh the more people you can get involved at every stage of the process so like peer review um or ha getting somebody to design one part of a game and you design another and then meeting and seeing how that goes uh and like sounding boards to bounce your ideas off of uh play testers uh, artists like however many people you can get involved as early as possible is always ideal because great design doesn't happen in a vacuum. It it happens in a forge uh, where there are lots of flames uh, and lots of embers. Uh, here you go, theming. Um, but yes, more more people um, because games are for people. They're for the public, right? So the the sooner you can open it up from just your own brain uh, and get it in front of others, uh, the better off you're going to be and the stronger your game will be. Yeah. I think I've got two, if I can be cheeky. Yeah, um, one's a bit specific, one's a bit general. Uh, specific bit of advice is if your game requi like requires adventure content, write an adventure, um, get something, because that is part of your system. Um, like, yeah, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, especially in the indie sphere, lots of people make a system and then put it out there and a lot of the work in running something like that is writing the adventure and creating that and not sort of providing that content as well uh, really i think hinders sort of your process uh the second more general point is to um put some pride aside and realize that our job is like just a, like if you write an amazing system you're just above the snacks in terms of importance at the table like the the person running the game the players in the game like their communication and their like how much they enjoy each other as people that's like obviously way up there there's uh your scheduling whether tim's had a bad day <laughs> there's like there's so much that's so important to role playing games and actually the system is surprisingly way down there um it's important and i love it um and it's the only bit that you often have control over like you can't make tim have a, have had a nice day and you can't you can't force relationships so you do have a lot of control over the system and the way the games run so that's the bit we focus on a lot i think uh just just put that that pride aside and know that yeah <laughs> what what oh. we're doing is is yeah. not as important as the people who play it and yeah. also just read as many RPGs as you can. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure both of you, like me, have so many. I'm just looking at my bookshelves full, full of RPGs. Read them all. If you can't play them, read them, own them, support them. Talk to creators, uh, virtual cons, in-person cons. Go to those indie RPG booths. Talk to people. Ask them about their games. Uh, that's that's the best way to learn. And Yeah. 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 Uh, everything's Everything's been done and they've solved your problem already. Yeah, yeah. I would also say that um, a lot of uh, games have free quick start rules. So if you can't afford to buy lots and lots and lots of games, go try out all the quick start rules and figure out which ones you want to know more about. Yeah. Like that, that's a good way to narrow it down. Uh, quick start rules are a really, really good idea, by the way, if you are making your own system <laughs> to help other people on board and start playing it. That was one of the questions that sadly we did not have time for today, um, is sharing your system with others, helping people learn to play all of those things. We may have to do a part two to guys. I'm so sorry. Yeah, there's so much in this topic. It's so good. I'd be, I of course, I'd be happy to come back. And, and also, you this. guys are too darn interesting. So I think it's that time, Jack. Who are you? Where can we find you? And what's the next thing you're working on? Uh, I'm Jack. You can find me at Riverhorse Games on Twitter. And uh, what I'm working on is Tales of Primordia. Check it out at riverhorse.eu slash Primordia. Sign up to the mailing list. Uh, amazing, family-friendly, gets kids into role-playing. You choose a dinosaur, you save the world. Uh, and the art is beautiful. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, my name is Celeste Conowich. Again, I am the senior game designer for Cobalt Press. Uh, right now, Cobalt Press is running a Kickstarter, Deep Magic 2, which is like a, a huge compendium of options, spells, all kinds of great stuff um, compatible with D&D 5th edition. Uh, it is also forward compatible with the new system that we are designing the code name Black Flag uh, RPG. So uh, very exciting things are happening there. So keep your eye on Cobalt Press if you want to hear more about uh, Black Flag uh, playtest 
testing is starting in February, which is right around the corner. Uh, so if you, I think we have a link in the chat. If you go there, you can find out more about what the heck Black Flag is. Uh, you can sign up for play testing uh, right there. Um, and then, yeah, make sure to check out Deep Magic too, because talks a lot about magic, love magic. Uh, I think it's one of the most fun mechanical ways to like make, you know, an RPG interesting. So I would love if you went and checked that out too. Uh, amazing. Uh, I think most of you know me. I'm Janet. I run World Anvil by day. By night, I write RPGs and- Fight uh, crime. Uh, fight crime. <laughs> no. By night, I write RPGs and also novels and fantasy things. It's fun. You should try it sometime. Uh, and uh, I think that is our show. So a massive thank you to everyone who came to listen today. A redonkulous thank you to Celeste and Jack for being here with me at unconscionable hours, saying amazing things. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mail it's, you. It's just become light. <laughs> it's just become light. The light has come. We are enlightened. Um, After an hour of talking about RPGs. Guys, big love to you all. Now grab your hammer. You know what to do? Go wild bales. Do it. Or, uh, hey, maybe build an RPG.